Francis Towson is an American lawyer and business executive who served as former Homeland Security Advisor to United States President George W. Bush from 2004 to 2007, and she's currently Executive Vice President for Corporate Affairs at Activision Blizzard. She previously served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor for Combating Terrorism. In 2008, Towson joined CNN as a contributor, but later switched over to CBS, where she was a national security analyst for them. Townsend was president of the Counter Extremism Project. Francis Townsend, welcome back to our channel and our show. Um, I'm going to start with my first question. How was your approach uh, to Afghanistan different than how the Biden administration uh, have been deal with it, dealing with it? You know, when I watched American diplomats and military leaving Kabul, it really sort of broke my heart because when we went into Afghanistan, we promised our partners we would be there for the long term. Um, we helped build schools, we helped build roads. We did, right, we were arm in arm with our partners there. Um, and they were concerned, especially sort of during the Bush administration, that the United States wouldn't have the wherewithal to stick with them. Um, the drawdown to 2,500 troops. You know, we have troops all over the world after wars in Germany and Korea, Japan. Um, 2,500 troops was not going to make a difference to the United States military to keep there. And what that enabled was our diplomats, our embassy, uh, thousands of contractors, and the multinational force. And so when the United States just pulls back, so does everybody else. And we saw the result of that in the fall of Kabul to the Taliban. And so I find it myself heartbreaking. Um, and I say to myself, if I was a gold star mother who had lost a child who was fighting in Afghanistan, how they must feel. Um, and so I think, I frankly think it's tragic that we we left the way we did. Uh, Madam Secretary, you played a big role in defeating Al-Qaeda at that time. Can you tell us more about the policies adopted uh, to combat uh, terrorism groups? So, we, what the United States did in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 was to develop additional tools. There was the Patriot Act. Um, there was an increased use of our Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is our intelligence wire tax apps. Um, um, and so there were a number of tools, but perhaps the most important thing we did was invest in our partnerships around the world. The United States understood we could not alone defeat Al Qaeda. We needed our partners and allies around the world. Um, and so we really invested heavily in those partnerships. Mm -hmm. And we used those partnerships to undermine Al Qaeda in those things that were essential, whether it was fighters or money, because um, we knew that our partners and allies could help us. I, I will tell you, um, it was the beginning of my relationship, my friendships in Saudi Arabia, and there was frankly, no partner more important to our, the success of the United States' fight against terrorism mm -hmm. than Saudi Arabia, and in particular, the Mabaha. Do you think that this cooperation that was established, established at your time will still remain strong as it was before in combating terrorism with Saudi Arabia? You know, the most important thing to me about this relationship from the founding of the kingdom and Roosevelt when they first met, um, is that it has survived politics, regardless of what party holds the White House. Um, and that's really the most important thing at, the, at a professional level, whether you're in the United States at the FBI or CIA, or you're in Saudi Arabia at GIP or Mabahith, the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter who the US leader is, we all wanna combat terrorism. Mm -hmm. And so those channels, thank, are very fortunately, remain open even when there are political disputes among leaders. Do you think that uh, Al-Qaeda will re-emerge uh, again in Afghanistan? Well, look, we, we've seen the, the, you know, the resurgence of the Taliban, the Haqqani network, uh, which had always had direct links both to Al-Qaeda and to drug trafficking uh, has seen a resurgence. Um, and so I think frankly, with the help of Pakistan, uh, and a very porous border, it's just natural we're going to see the resurgence of Al Qaeda. And I think the international community is going to have to be ready to deal with that. Mm -hmm. 
Madam Secretary, it is often said that Israel intelligence uh, or Israel is the country that tips the president of the United States of any um, threats or the most relevant information concerning terrorism. Is that true? So I'm, I'm going to start with, you know, I, the first thing that I think of when you talk about the most important tips, I can remember Saudi Arabia tipping the United States during the Obama administration and preventing a terrorist attack on our soil. So yes, do we have a good intelligence relationship with Israel? We do, um, but they're not our only important partner. We have very important partners around the world um, that also, and look, we do the same thing. If we're aware of, a, of an imminent threat to one of our partners or allies, we share that information as well. And that's the only reason it works, right? Because it work, information flows in both directions. Mm -hmm. What would you say about Iran's promotion uh, of terrorism, Iranian, Iranian regime, the Mullah regime? Right. Look, the Iranians are the world's single largest state sponsor of terrorism, and, no, and it knows no bounds, frankly. Nowhere is it more disruptive a force than in the region, where, where in the Gulf. Um, look what they've done with the Houthi in Yemen and threaten the security of the kingdom, particularly, uh, particularly along your southwestern border. Um, but it's not just there. It's not limited to there. It, the American military had to deal with uh, Iranian forces in Iraq. Um, they're all over, right? They've infiltrated themselves. In, the Iranians have used the chaos in Afghanistan to infiltrate themselves there. We know that they've used their operatives in Africa. Um, and so Look, they are a destabil an internationally destabilizing regime that uses any access to the financial system to feed those terrorist groups that are subversive and meant to undermine legitimate governments uh, and legitimate regimes. Do you think that Hezbollah is a real threat for the United States and its alliance alliances? And how do you describe the the com comportment or, or the behavior of Trump administration toward Hezbollah especially? So Hezbollah has, has been and has remained in my judgment, a serious threat. Um, you know, with the, I think the Trump administration showed great courage in the targeting of, of Soleimani, um, who had been an enormous threat to the United States as well as to the region and others. Um, of course, he was behind the Leban Lebanon barracks bombing back in the 1980s. Um, he was sort of the terrorist in chief, if you will. Um, and clearly, he, he took his direction from the mullahs in Iran. Um, and so Hezbollah was their sort of deployable force, if you will, um, that didn't wear a uniform. And so it made them far more dangerous. Um, and that continues to this day. I mean, Hezbollah is a target of FBI and domestic terrorist law enforcement operations here in the United States to this day. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate uh, or describe the joint effort between the United States and the Arab, United Arab Emirates in listing these groups or putting them on, on sanctions? So the UAE has been a tremendous partner to the United States going back even before my time in the White House. Um, they were also, they were with us. They were one of the first countries with us in Afghanistan to deploy. Um, and look at the, the capability of their deployable force when they were in Yemen. Um, it's small, but very, very capable. Um, and they have also been a huge advisor, if you will. They've been a great partner in terms of helping the United States think through its Iran policy, for example. Um, they've been a tremendous partner working the, the relationship with the United States, Saudi Arabia, and the Emirates, and helping us, the United States, they, they host military, US military forces there, and helping us think through pol our foreign policy in the region. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Abraham Accords embodies, uh, embody anti-terror uh, strategies? I do. Um, look, this is, it is meant to find a peaceful solution um, and so it, it at its essence is, in it by its nature, frankly, an anti-terrorist sort of um, policy and program. 
Um, I do think that, look, we need, we need the Abraham Accords to be successful in order to see greater peace in the region. Mm -hmm. What about Erdogan and the Turkey uh, regime, the Turkish regime? Do they protect several terror groups, in your opinion? They do, and it's a, it's a long list. Um, look, er Erdogan has been himself very close to the Brotherhood um, and allowed the Brotherhood to see a resurgence in Turkey, but that's not, those, that's not the only group. Um, this, is, this is a leader who sees himself as a contender for the sort of the greatest influence in the Muslim world it's sort of a very narcissistic view of who he is in the world. Um, but it tells you something that he, he allies himself with groups like the Muslim Brotherhood um, and extremist Turkish domestic groups in order to retain his own power. That's his identity, that's his political base. And that ought to tell us something about why, how we should view him and whether the world should trust him as a leader. Madam Secretary, can you tell us more about Hamas and its terrorism um, based on your experience in monitoring them or mm -hmm. monitoring this group? Yes. Um, so look, you know, we were big supporters and proponents um, of democratic elections. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being in the Bush administration and at the time, King Abdullah saying, be careful, you, right? You may, trade, there's an English saying, uh, be careful trading the devil you know for the devil you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and we supported elections and we saw Hamas get elected by the Palestinians. Um, they are not, a, they are of course a terrorist group, but to the extent even using funds, we found that they were using funds, you know, far, whether it was from the United States or elsewhere to support the families of martyrs right, who were blowing themselves up and committing terrorist acts. Um, that's sort of the easiest example mm -hmm. that, I, that I can give you. Um, and we've seen no change. The, the Hamas has done nothing for the Palestinian people. They've not produced over time. They've stolen from the, from the coffers that, of money that should have gone to the Palestinians themselves um, and not produced for, the, for those people. And it's, it, it's a shame um, but it's sort of in, endemic in the fact that this is really a terror organization. Mm -hmm. I believe also you had uh, strong dealings with Egypt to fight terrorism, especially through your contacts with former intelligent director, General Omar Suleiman. Can you remember uh, anything about this collaboration? So Egypt's a complicated com uh, country. Um, and again, this was... Omar Suleiman was a very influential person because he was respected throughout the Arab world. And so he was one to, he was not just the head of intelligence, he, although that was the role he held when I dealt with him, he had far more influence than that. And that was clearly seen later in his ascension in the government. Um, but Omar was the person you would go to for advice about whether it was an intelligence issue it was a disagreement between our, our partners. Um, he had, he was enormously respected, not only because he was the head of intelligence in Egypt, but because of his judgment and the respect he held. Um, and so he was a very positive force. I mean, you know, I, I he was somebody I enjoyed working with um, and he was really, uh, Quite capable. Mm -hmm. How do you see now the future of Egypt during the Sisi's uh, presidency? So President Sisi is a real relief, right? A after the Morsi presidency, this is another example of an outcome after the Arab Spring, um, where we wound up again, there was an election and we, wi we unexpectedly wind up with a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and a very dangerous place, right? Because of the influence of Egypt itself, uh, both in the Arab world and its his historical influence. President Sisi has a tough job. Um, it's not easy, I, as I said, it's a difficult, complicated country mm -hmm. to rule over, um, but I think he's done a good job. Um, the most important thing for him will be the economy. Um, because it's essential to sort of every facet of 
Egypt's daily living, right? Whether it's security or it's schools or healthcare. Um, and I think he's made a real effort. I know when he's here in the United States, he reaches out to the American business community, um, trying to keep those channels open um, and work on behalf of the Egyptian people. How do you assess the situation in Sudan now, security-wise, uh, after the overthrow of uh, on Omar al-Bashir in 2019 and after the remove of sanctions recently? So, look, there's much positive that we've seen happen after Bashar, Bashir's removal. Um, and life in most places, in most parts, has begun to return to something that looks more like normal, right? And it, more in terms of its everyday security. Um, that said, it's not perfect. Uh, clearly there are pockets of terrorist groups and activities that have to be contended with by the government. Um, it's dispersed and so it makes it more, it makes it more difficult, a more difficult challenge to address. Um, but I think we have to be patient and give the, the new government time to be able to assemble itself and be able to be effective against these forces, but it's important that they get there and that the international community support that um, so that it doesn't become, it, it doesn't become the Taliban of, Afghan, uh, of Sudan. Was in your opinion, the Arab Spring a good or bad development in America's uh, policy uh, or efforts uh, toward combating terrorism? So I think it's not a, it's not a, one word answer. I don't think it's a good or bad. I think you have to go country by country. As I, you know, I use the example in Egypt, I think the, the election of Morsi as a result of the fall of Mubarak was very unfortunate. Um, on the other hand, I think there are other places that had more positive and slower change, right? I think whenever we see dramatic change that flips like a light switch, that becomes dangerous. Right, because it's not a, it is not controlled and it's not measured over time. Where there's more gradual change, we've seen some positive developments in, in, in the Sahel and North Africa, um, but it's not uniform. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate the global uh, fight against terrorism 20 years after 9 11? You know, it's interesting that you should ask. You know, on 9 11, I was home on maternity leave with my second child. Um, and he has just celebrated his 20th birthday. And so I have a living reminder of the span of time. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, it's a little different. I view it globally. We have been tremendously successful, but we can, we can never take too much. We can take pride in that, but not comfort. Um, that, that fight is never gonna be over. The same is true here in the United States, but we've had a new problem develop here in the United States that if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I never would have imagined. We have a domestic terrorism problem here. I mean, I can remember talking to my colleagues in Saudi Arabia about what it felt like when we were fighting with them, their own, your, the own domestic terrorism problem. But it never occurred to me that we would have American citizens undermining the American government. Um, and so when January 6th happened here, it was a real wake up call. We now devote, it forced the United States government to devote substantial resources to domestic terrorism in a way it had never considered before. Mm -hmm. um, those resources had all been devoted to international terrorism. And so uh, the, the current administration has the challenge of having to fight, as I say, on two fronts. They have to continue to fight the international terrorism battle, but they also have this new sort of challenge here at home. Mm -hmm. What about what uh, Lloyd Austin, uh, Secretary of Defense, said on a new war concerning the cyber attacks or uh, it's a, a kind of defense war, but in a different way? Is it more dangerous or less dangerous than the direct terrorism and the bombing and the threats, these kind of threats? So I, I think it is, a, it is a very big threat now. I, I think people do a lot of talking about it. I, I agree with Secretary Austin, um, that it is a among the most serious threats the United States faces. I don't think we're doing enough. This was, you know, pre 9-11, people talked about the threat of international terrorism, but it wasn't until there was the 9-11 attack that we actually did something about it. 
And it took us time to sort of ramp up and become effective. My worry is the same with sort of cyber security issues. Um, and the reason it's such a threat is because it can not only be used by terrorists. So imagine an instance where they combined both cyber, turn the lights out, and a physical attack, blow up, use a car bomb, right? The tragedy of that. Um, but they can also, it's a threat to the financial system. And a, a threat to the financial system in the United States is a global financial threat. And so, or a threat to aviation and air traffic control. All those things are vulnerable because all of it now is connected to the internet. And so this is where I think allies and partners must work together. I think the United States must be better prepared, must invest more resources. Um, we're beginning to do that, but there's a lot more I think that needs to be done. My question before the last one is about UAE and uh, investing in discovering the space in uh, intelligence, uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we are witnessing Expo 2020. There is a deal now. Uh, it started with the USA concerning the F-35 uh plane so how do you see the evolution of uae and its position now and her main role in the middle east in security economy and all levels so the the uae is it's such a look it it, it enjoys a crucial geographic um place in in the heart of the gulf um its proximity to iran is a both a is a real vulnerability, um, but it's it has as I think I suggested earlier outsized influence um, to its size. I do think uh, that the relationship with the United States United States has only gotten stronger. The notion that there's a civilian nuclear program in the UAE is probably the best indication of our confidence and trust in the Emiratis. Um, and so I think that'll only get stronger with time. They're, they have a particularly strong military relationship, a very strong diplomatic relationship. And I do think that the commercial relationship has grown and continues to grow over time. Mm -hmm. My last question, you were the top advisor to President Bush, George W. Bush on Homeland Security. Tell us please, how did you feel about this kind of high level appointment? You know, it was very unusual. I, when I was appointed, um, mostly those positions, people who report directly to the president, Condi Rice at the time, for example, had been with the president since the time of the campaign. They were political people. It's very unusual that the president would have next to him, around him, someone who spent their whole career in the government. Um, and it was not a political person. He had no idea. He never asked what my political views were. Um, and I thought it took real courage to bring me in um, and to ask my advice. I will say it was a unique time in our history. This was post 9-11 and there weren't political people who had counterterrorism experience. And so the president took the risk because I think in his judgment that he needed that advice for, to be able to make good decisions. For me, it was such a privilege and such an honor uh, to be able to be there at that at a moment that was so crucial in American history. Um, and frankly, my children were very little and they grew up sort of in the White House, in the West Wing, watching history as it was made. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Francis Towson. Uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your time. I really enjoyed this interview. Thank you. This is great fun. Thank you very much for having me, Maria. Thank you.